Welcome back to the WTS. My name is Steve Ramsey, and this is a podcast about creative people. Scott Reeder is a Hollywood prop master who is responsible for everything actors touch on a film or television set. A big part of his job is sourcing or creating realistic objects that look like the real thing, but are safe for the actors to use, such as bottles you can bust over somebody's head, glass shards you can chew on, that's what I want to do, or shards that you can roll around on, retractable knives, I really want to get me a retractable knife, or non-alcoholic whiskey, but he's also called on to create props that won't interfere with the sound recording on a set, things like paper bags that don't rattle and silent billiard balls. Some of the films he's worked on include some of my personal favorites, such as The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Beginning. I was a real fan of that sequel. Friday the 13th, the 2009 remake, Machete, Grindhouse. What an awesome movie that is. And the underrated Nosferatu series. I was kind of bummed when that thing got canceled. He's worked on Pitch Perfect, Friday Night Lights, the original Walker, Texas Ranger, as well as the current reboot, Walker. And this is just a bit of his resume over the past 20 years. In May of 2020, Scott created a TikTok account and started posting videos telling dad jokes. It wasn't until a few months later when he posted a video of himself busting breakaway bottles on his head that the account really took off. See, that's what you got to do. Bust bottles against your head. That's exactly. It, it gets people's attention for sure. Today, Scott Prop and Roll has over 1.4 million followers on TikTok. And about a year ago, he created the Scott Prop and Roll YouTube channel where he's killing it with YouTube shorts. He's found a winning formula of interesting and informative prop videos that almost always end with a dad joke. But an, an elevated right. <laughs> dad joke. It's it's elevated above your run-of-the-mill dad joke. It's You might say it's a really propped up pun that will prop, probably <laughs> make you groan i tried hey scott welcome to the show <laughs> so happy to be here thank you it was a good job with the the it's a proper pun oh there. man I, I was i was trying there i'm not really good at doing <laughs> you seem to do those dad jokes perfectly because they it, so what you do is and the reason why they're an elevated dad joke is because you have like a one-two punch on those sometimes you'll have you're talking about the the prop that you're making, which is very interesting. It segues neatly into a pun, and you go, "Oh, I see what you did there." But boom, boom, you followed up with <laughs> with the pun on top of that one. Really <laughs> Those are the fun ones where you can, you know, the setup and then uh, hammer it home. Yeah, for sure. Hey, I guess we should start by defining what exactly is a prop on and how it differs from other items on a set. Yeah, you know, we're real departmentalized in the film industry. Um, you know, you've got your costumes, special effects, uh, set decoration. A lot of times there are gray areas, and we just kind of, you know, communicate with each other and figure out who's going to do what. But typically the, uh, the go-to saying is, for props, anything touched or held. Um, you know, uh, that being said, you know, a, a, a painting hanging on a wall would be set decoration, but if the actor grabs the painting and busts it over someone's head, then it's prop. So we, we all work hand in hand and figure out how we're going to uh, approach a, you know, a scene. And, so and, if somebody uh, needs to rearrange the furniture, they gotta move the coffee table, that's still part of the set decoration. Mm -hmm. And there's an on-set dresser that is there to you know, help with that, but props jumps in and helps with that stuff too. It's just, you know, yeah. we all uh, help each other out when needed. So how does that work at the when a script comes through or screenplay? I guess none of this stuff is really spelled out in detail, is it? Uh, not too much. Some more than others. So you have when you're reading a script, you have screen direction and then dialogue. Uh, some people make the mistake of only reading the screen direction because that's kind of your blueprint. But sometimes there'll be little telltale signs in the dialogue that aren't mentioned in the screen direction. So as a prop master, we you know, really have to comb through everything, dialogue, screen direction. Um, and then we'll, uh, so for a, like a TV series, we, um, we move at a real fast pace. We'll shoot seven, uh, seven or eight working days. 
So, and we're, while we're filming an episode, we're also prepping. So I have a team on set that hands the props to the actors that keeps continuity. Um, and then at the same time, I have myself and a buyer that are, you know, uh, breaking down the next script and making sure, uh, you know, that we have the time to fabricate or acquire whatever we need. Um, and that can be, uh, yeah, that's that's what I love about my job is it's uh, it's always different. So it's this is a great job for someone who gets bored easily because it's 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 all just solving problems really. It's like you know you and you've got to consider the environment. So uh, recently we had like a fight scene that took place on a lake, you know, on a boat dock, and a, a bad guy pulls a knife. The knife ends up getting kicked into the water. Well, we have to worry about, we don't want to litter, uh, but we've got to, you know, see this thing from a wide shot and a close-up falling in the water. So I talked to my, uh, I've got a mold maker here in town that, um, you know, would come up with a, make, to make sure that our rubber knife floats, you know, that, that it's not, you know, because some will sink. So we got to make it out of more of a self-skinning foam so it'll, uh, but add a little weight so it'll go down for the shot and then pop, plop back up. And, you know, and then we also, as a backup plan, if that didn't work, you know, uh, monofilament tied to, you know, to, and, you know, so w we prepare for all, you know, possibilities. And uh, uh, like I said, it's troubleshooting. And then, you know, stuff always comes up as you're filming. And that's why you want to have a really good experienced person on set who can troubleshoot and you know and you know come up with uh, uh you know a solution you know put out fires on the day so uh you know if you build a good team you know and you have a lot of resources uh at your fingertips it's not too bad but uh but i i, I like the challenge so as much as you possibly can you're in charge of looking through the script knowing what's going to be shot and trying to imagine every possible prop that you might need ahead of time and it, are there correct. are there times when you're right in the middle of a scene and the actor's like, "Oh crap, I'm supposed to be pulling a pen out of my pocket or something." Yeah, well, that's easy. We have we have those. <laughs> I'm sure that's ready. an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's it's things like you know food scenes, making sure that you know the uh, you know the dietary restrictions that an actor uh -huh. may have. Um, it's all the all that, and you know arranging for all the food, making sure uh, that you have a ton of it. Uh, in case they do 20 takes and just communicate, com you know, having a good communication line uh, with the director to, uh, you know, because some, it, and when you're going at this pace, you get to where you know the directors and, you know, this particular director, he, he does a lot of takes or this one is like two takes and you're done. Uh, you know, so we kind of prepare along those lines too, as far as for quantity of uh, items. And uh, yeah, we do. Uh, we meet with the director. Uh, we basically have a big concept meeting with all the department heads. Then um, I'll do a basically a prop list, a big shopping list, um, uh, scene by scene uh, that I prepare for the director. I'll have a meeting with the director, um, tell them you know make, to make sure we're on the same page about things. And uh, if they have any notes, they can give them to me then. We go on a location scout. A lot of times, um, especially for television, it's good for the prop master to go see the locations because if we're filming at a restaurant, I can work a deal with the owner of the uh, location to, to help with providing food, see what, you know, do they have an ice machine? Are we going to have to bring our own ice? Are we going to need fake ice for this scene? And, you know, it's just, uh, uh, you know, so that's like the day after the prop meeting is location scout. And then we have a big show and tell the day before we film where I lay everything out at uh, our office warehouse and show them, you know, show them everything laid out that I was able to round up so far and, uh, and get their approval on it. That way, when we show up on the day, uh, they've already signed off on the stuff and, and uh, you know, it's just the, the last minute things you have to worry about. What are some of the most yeah. challenging props that you have to either source or create? I know you, you had a video showing you, I, it was a period piece, I guess, and you needed to have mm -hmm. a, a vintage 7-Up can or, or something like that. And mm -hmm. yeah, and so yeah. You, you actually had to make a, a fake label for it. Because anything that would be around today would just be all rusted and no good. It needs to look 
it, real. Exactly. You can sometimes find some new old stock, but it's hard to find, especially if you're on if you're on a time constraint. Um, I would say dealing with um, old technology. Uh, mm. That's a. Uh, I did a show set in 1915. Oh, um, really old television. technology. <laughs> yeah, I did, I, it was a show uh, called The Sun for uh, AMC uh, with Pierce Brosnan. And we had to have a, uh, it was a dictaphone. And those yeah. were the, uh, basically it was the predecessor to the, you know, vinyl record. And they're on a cylinder, you know. Um, it was like, like a, a the big size, cone the size that like a cone you would speak into, right? I've seen oh, Well, there's, there's that. They have uh, the cone, but it was a cylinder is instead of a, instead of like a, like. A, oh, a cylinder know, like, record. Instead of, instead of a vinyl record yeah. like that, uh, it would be like the size of this water bottle. Yeah. You know, and it would load in and would record oh. uh, on it. And they're made of wax. And, uh, but we had to do it all practically on camera, have him, talking into the horn wow. and then playing it back. And uh, so, but, but we, we love doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's fun to tinker, take the thing apart, put it back together and uh, watch a lot of YouTube videos on, cause there are people out there that, uh, that, uh, you know, are more um, uh, schooled in that than we are. That's what, you know, the whole Jack of all trades, master of none really applies to, the prop master position because you've you've got to kind of make yourself just a temporary expert just for the little bit of time to get it on camera for those few seconds and then move on. Now I would imagine today you know? 3D printing has got to be a godsend for the industry and especially I noticed oh, you just got a 3D printer didn't you? Yes, I don't. Yeah, I typically sub it out because, you know, I'm kind of as a prop master, you're kind of a general contractor. Right. So I'm, I have uh, uh, just down the street, I have a friend of mine that, uh, you know, will he'll he'll do the 3D prints for me. And uh, like we did our uh, let me see if I have one like we did our our Texas Ranger badge. Uh, we had to do a custom made one. Um, so we did a 3D print. Then we did. Um, then we did a wax. Had to do a wax mold to bring to the silversmith, who you know cast it and everything. So I, I, you know, kind of have to supervise all the different steps. And yeah, definitely three D printing is one of them. So as a prop master, are you? Do you run your own business and then you like sub it out to different productions? Well, no. What I do, I'm I'm hired as an individual to prop master shows. I as kind of a side business. I have a prop shop and I rent props. Oh, okay. You know, and plus, I've, you've got I've an got... inventory whenever you need something, you can draw mm -hmm. upon. It looks like a warehouse. Yes. Basically, I have a where I have a warehouse with all my props that I rent to other productions. In a lot of cases in Austin, it would be a lot of independent films and commercials, along with whatever TV shows are in town. Um, and I also uh, have what's called a prop master's kit, which is a 53 foot truck that I call kind of my Walmart on wheels. It has a little bit of everything, uh, general props, uh, stock items that, that travel to every uh, set. And uh, that way, if something's requested last minute, we can go grab it, you know, like general things like uh, police props, um, uh, if we're doing a street scene, you know, briefcases, uh, backpacks for a school scene, school books, um, you know, in one thing in television and uh, dealing with net networks and whatnot, uh, clearances are a big issue. So everything has to be kind of, uh, if it's going to be seen on camera, it's got to go through the network clearance person, the legal team. Um, you mean as far as like if it's like branded? As far as seeing any kind of logos yeah. or, yeah, or just like I said, like with, with school books, and whatnot, they need to be either cleared, uh, you know, signed off from the company that made that book, or they need to uh, be a just a fake, you know, fake graphics, yeah. which we have a full time graphic designer that, you know, makes newspapers, uh, police, you know, statements, uh, you know, all that. And, uh, uh, content on phones, 
and computers is a big deal yeah. as well. And that's got to be so, kind of fun making that stuff, especially today. Because back in the day, if you showed a newspaper on a film, nobody would really read it. But now everybody's pausing that to read all those oh, yeah. <laughs> articles. Oh, yeah. And then with uh, when HD, like in the early 2000s, when, you know, you're looking at the monitor and you see things you've never seen before. I'm like, oh, my gosh, we're, we're going to have to step up our game. Yeah. You know, it's a lot easier to see the monofilament. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, yeah, that and the pause, the pause button. Yeah, that <laughs> kind of changed things. That gets you. That definitely you got to be careful. So I know a lot of what you do is working on weapons, fake weapons. Does that include like fake guns or or mm -hmm. would a fake gun? Because there's like obviously a guy who handles real guns would be a separate thing an armor yeah right and that, but that's like the prop master typically hires the armor or lines up the armor with the you know yeah you know works with the production manager to find someone uh, are most of the time you know, though it's, are, just, it's the replica aren't they like guns or they use real guns? they uh de definitely are now we uh um you know with the Unfortunate incident the Alec uh, on the set of the movie Rust yeah. uh, that really, uh, you know, got people to uh, be a little more. I mean, we were always super careful. I mean, th th that's such a weird thing that happened. Um, you know, as far as um, I did a a show that required basically you have blank adapted weapons, so they're real weapons that have been adapted to fire blanks. So if I have an army, uh, like an, uh, an M4, if I were to try to put a blank in it, it would, uh, it would fire once and then jam. So you have to basically plug the barrel to hold the gas inside mm. and uh, so it'll uh, cycle. Um, but I did a show that was uh, for National Geographic that was eight episodes of an ambush. And I had a team of uh, like five armorers. We had like almost every day we had like a hundred people firing. Like I said, it was about a, an actual ambush that took place in 2004 in Iraq. And, um, it was nonstop. And I was, I was a nervous wreck just because of having so many people <laughs> firing blank weapons. Um, I do have, and what I would use are the higher dollar airsoft, basically the toy guns, uh, for the background that work that are gas operators co2 operated for uh you know insurgents on the rooftops that sort of thing um and then try to keep the uh, blank you know the conventional uh, we call it conventional blank gunfire up closer to camera so the prop master does have a uh, you know uh help a lot with that but yes but there is a dedicated armor uh, or several, depending on uh, the need. On uh, the current show that I'm on, uh, we're 100% airsoft at this hmm. point. And uh, but I I hired an armor to, you know, oversee all that. Just you know, so we want the crew and the actors right. all to feel comfortable. We use rubber guns a lot of the time. You know, we have very good, uh, you know, fake, you know, rubber weapons, and then. Um, airsofts that are full metal that look real and you, right. you clear them with the assistant director and make sure everyone's comfortable but yeah but they that's uh since uh computer generated muzzle flash has, yeah. has gotten so much better i mean just since you know just in the last 10 years it's amazing yeah they used to look uh, really I remember corny. Back, now they look pretty good huh yeah back in 2014 it looked like an iphone app <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's just know. like a white X yeah. for uh, for the uh, straight on, and then for the side view, it was like this cone shape. Uh, but now they now they 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 look pretty legit. Now we're getting into also uh, uh, adding in the uh, shell ejection hmm. and that sort of thing. What about the and uh, with the props themselves? Is there any like like trend towards digitizing the actual prop, like basically holding a green prop and having that done in post? Um, not so much, yeah. not, not so much yet because the actors need to feel, you know, that, that kind of, you get to where you're having to realize the actors having to, it's, it's a lot easier if they have the real, yeah. have a real calculator and not, you <laughs> a know, block just a green, green block, yeah. you know, I mean, but it's all about budget. So if it's supposed to be 
this, uh, you know, uh, holographic, you know, uh, item that's floating in their hands, then that would all be, a, you know, a green ball or whatever. Um, uh, Robert Rodriguez here in Austin, Texas, um, who did Sin City and, you know, Grindhouse. And oh, he's one of my machete. favorites. I love everything um, Robert Rodriguez he, does. He does a lot of green screen, but they still fabricate most, of, I'd say, you know, 75% of the hand props are, you know, are practical. Um, and then they'll uh, either, they'll enhance. So right now it's a lot of, you know, CGI enhancing, vis visual effects enhancing. But every background uh, that Rodriguez does, I mean, the, you, most of them are all green screen. Yeah, I think he was probably mm -hmm. doing that even back when, like, Spy Kids. He did Spy Kids, and mm -hmm. I remember some really crazy stuff happening in that, too. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. I, as a side note, just to see his career starting from El Mariachi with, like, an $8,000 budget or something. Mm -hmm. doing these Yeah, things. even less than yeah, that. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, like 6000 <laughs> Oh, man. And... Uh, but yeah, he's uh, but he's he's uh, stayed in Austin as a studio here. And, oh wow! Uh, and uh, has been just as a regular crew here. I uh, was I've always just kind of come in uh, when they'll have two projects going at the same time. I've I've kind of built my career outside of uh, Troublemaker, but I'm v very good friends with all those people. And I'll, I'll like I said, I'll if there's an overflow project, I'll help out if I can. And uh, like I said, I did Machete, which was amazing to work on. But that was a, a truly a low-budget deal. But we had, like, Robert De Niro, yeah. uh, Jessica Alba. We uh, had just a huge uh, cast. Um, and uh, But in a lot for the budget, that I'm just amazed at what, you know, we were able to pull off on that. So are, are you part of a guild or something I'm in the union. It's uh, 484 film workers. Uh, uh, well, it's Texas 484, but it's um, uh, International Association of Theater Employees. Oh, okay. I think it's it's an old union that goes way back. Um, there is a prop union out of Los Angeles, local 44, and um, I'm a now a founding member of the Prop Masters Guild, which is a kind of a lobbying group and a, you know just to raise awareness of what prop masters do and you know because uh and in the prop department there are so many different ways you can go because i'm i'm a prop master like i said i'm kind of a general contractor and i i uh oversee things on and off set uh but you have your set prop assistants who deal with uh the actors and you have uh prop fabricators uh prop mold makers um you know there's a uh, you know, the con construction department helps out a lot as well. And uh, uh, there are so many different avenues you can go in if you l enjoy film and, right. and uh, just kind of want to be around that. If you can, you know, swing a hammer, you can get a job. You know, as far as if you've got a construction background, you can work in the construction department in building sets. I mean, the only difference is instead of two by fours, you're using uh, one right. by fours. <laughs> and is it, it's, does uh, it make any yeah. difference? as far as the the guild that you formed whether that's stage screen television all of it's together uh, actually that's that's it's strictly film oh, the Pro film. property masters guild is is film and television and that you formed that for what reason was there well i didn't there's the founding uh, the the four founders are like uh, josh melcher uh, out of LA and but I was I one there were about 23 of us that uh, for a year and a half we worked at uh, at uh, getting it up and running and getting the website so it's called the property property masters guild pmg.org and what was the motivation behind behind setting that up um like I said kind of raising awareness of uh that we exist uh <laughs> Uh, but there wasn't and, like a grievance against. Oh Hollywood, no, no, like, no not not at all. <laughs> really, it was just to kind yeah. of promote promote uh, what we do and to bring in uh, people to the field, you know, because uh, to okay. to find uh, to find people that. Yeah, how did how help. did you get started in all of this? I kind of I was um, I kind of fell into it. Um, I was going to University of North Texas. There happened to be a movie filming in town. It was called uh, Daddy's Dying, Who's Got the Will, with uh, Beverly D'Angelo, Bo Bridges, Judge Reinhold, 
1989. So I've been at this over 30, over 30 years. Um, oh, wow. And I interned. I just went. Uh, I found out where they were, that they were filming at a hospital, and I just showed up and told them I'd do anything. I'll pick up trash. I'll empty the trash cans for you. I'll do whatever. And I just kind of started out as an intern, and I would help lock up the set. They'd give me a radio, put me out on the road, and I'd keep cars from coming down to where we were filming, or yeah, or literally picking up trash, getting coffee for the assistant directors, what, whatever I needed to do just to kind of get my foot in the door. And then I ended up being placed with the prop department, helping them out on uh, some bar scenes and food scenes. And um, I, I enjoyed the art department part of it. So I, that's kind of how I kind of fell into that. But I floated around doing camera, different departments for a while before I ended up settling back into doing props. Is it, a, is it hard getting gigs? Is it like an actor where you're always in search of your next gig? Well, it's it's definitely more word of mouth you kind of once people find out about you and get your phone number then you can you know it's just kind of networking and if they see your performance on one job then if they like you you'll get asked to do another it's kind of kind of like that right. and um uh you do you know there are uh i mean the the best way to do it is to find out where if you're in an area where there is a production happening it's just reaching out to the production manager getting your resume there letting them know what your what your skill set is and you know that you what department you'd like to get in or find out a you know a prop mm -hmm. master try to get a hold of them and let them know you're available for work or call the union the main thing is because most of the of the jobs unless it's a lower budget independent film will be you know, kind of have a union agreement and uh, probably the best thing to, to do is get your name on a union work list so when there's a lot going on in town uh, you know you'll be one of the people called when they're in need of help what would be a good place to start for for somebody 18 years old interested in in getting into this line? I would definitely say, like I said, depending on what state you're in, most states have a film commission and they'll have oh. job tips on the film commission website, like here in Texas, uh, Los Angeles, uh, pardon me, in California. Well, LA has its own commission as well. You can get onto either the California film commission website, uh, Los Angeles, uh, even, you know, but in like San Francisco, they've got one. Uh, Atlanta, Georgia is big time right now. So if you, if you can pick up move yes. stakes to uh, Georgia, everything's shot in Georgia mm -hmm. now, isn't it? Georgia and Canada. Uh, yes, correct. And, and yeah. <laughs> nothing's shot in California. Anymore. Well, there's some, but <laughs> as far as as far as the greatest <laughs> influx, where there are need probably a need of people would be like going to Georgia. Yeah. Uh, in Louisiana, has a lot going on as well, and. Um, you know, just uh, like I said, getting on, uh, calling the union and getting your name on a list and just being proactive and reaching out to prop masters, art directors, set decorators, and, you know, getting your name out there. And once you, they, they see your skill set and your work ethic, yeah. then you'll, you know, if you prove yourself as a hard worker, then you'll, you'll continue to get calls. I th it sounds like there's a lot of overlap between these, these different departments, whether you're designing sets, sourcing, you know, props or making the set design itself the furniture and all of that sort of thing do you guys all work together really really oh well? yes we have Is there any, any time somebody steps on your toes and you're like no, oh every once in a while but we pretty much as long as you communicate i try to I, communication yeah. is everything and so if i see something in the script that's i'm concerned about i'll just flat out call the construction coordinator or the set decorator um and say hey the script says this do you want me to do it or are you going to do it or I, I'm totally cool with doing it. You just let me know if you've got too much on your plate right now. I don't mind doing it. That sort of thing. I've just, you know, let them know that I'm, you know, willing to take it on. There are gray area things, you know, um, and like with special with special effects, a lot of times we'll provide all the we'll get all the parts and pieces and then effects will adapt it. You know, like we had a scene where a champagne bottle had to uh, what it. It's called sabering, where you take a champagne bottle and you, you a big, a big like steak knife. Oh yeah, and yeah. knock the top off it. of yeah. it. 
And uh, so I bought all the parts and pieces, got with uh, with effects, and they they did the R and D on that, and they they rigged it with a hose to where it could you know uh, where it's lightly the end was lightly glued on, and then they have a a tank you know uh, a hose running yeah. through the person's sleeve, and, and and but it worked it worked great you know but there's stuff like that where we'll. Uh, and that's worth working with, like visual that's effects. Special that's effects. That's, that's special yeah, effects. That's special effects. That's special effects. That's you know. So special effects is or the practical effects people, and then you'll have a visual effects company. Is typically in L.A. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, we work hand in hand with uh, with the visual effects department as well, um, and we'll mm-hmm. call them up if there's ever anything, you know. Deal. A lot of times it's with technology, dealing with phones. You know, seeing something specifically on a phone and uh, uh, computer or um, if they're doing uh, what do they call it set adding on to a lot of times like if you're seeing a street scene everything in the foreground is practical and then they'll oh, cut the set extension, oh, right. the extension. set extension yeah. mm-hmm. and uh, so we'll uh, work with them on uh, elements a lot of times we'll provide them with uh, yeah we just call them elements so we'll uh, give them an item that they'll scan and drop that in. Uh, When the pandemic hit, I was working on a show for Amazon called Panic. And uh, when we came back, we had still owed a scene with that had 200 extras at this race, right? So they, of course, no one wanted to have that many people with, you know, being, you know, know, like September, of 2020, uh, they wanted to limit it to like 15 extras. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we would bring in 15 extras at a time in front of a green screen, give them a backpack, give them a beer or whatever the item was and, um, have them, you know, interacting with their hand props, film them doing that. And then when we did the wide shot of the race, they just pasted in all the extras, you know, and it looks pretty wow. darn good. It's amazing what yeah, they're it's able amazing. to do. Yeah. Like crowd extensions, mm-hmm. I guess. I mean, back in the day, they used to have to you know, hire thousands of extras mm-hmm. to, on the set. For oh, I remember. Well. I did, uh, what was it, Necessary Roughness back in 91. Mm-hmm. We had 10,000 extras one time. And, uh, yeah, so I was having to provide popcorn and drinks for <laughs> All those people, but uh, uh, we, but even then, with the ten thousand extras, you're filling up a, a huge stadium. We we had back, and this is again early '90s. We had plywood people, <laughs> so they had cut out all these <laughs> plywood shapes, and they would take people's pictures and staple oh. T-shirts to these sheets of plywood that looked, yeah. <laughs> and uh, oh man, having to move those around was a nightmare. Then another company came along. Not long after that, in the mid '90s, the late '90s, called I think the inflatable crowd. So like, and when you watch like Secretariat, I think they use these inflatable uh-huh. torsos that would clip onto the stadium seat, and they would just add T-shirts and hats and <laughs> you know wigs to them. Uh, and yeah, just inflatable blow-up people, um, just top half and with little like chip clips yeah. on the bottom. And Amazing. they would fill stadiums with that. We did that for a movie called The Ringer as well, what they brought in. And it, it I saw where they're that. using like these animatronic babies now. Mm-hmm. Is that something that you you use? Because I've they look like a legit thing, mm-hmm. but you don't have to you know hire a baby. I've, I did a show called The Leftovers for HBO, and we had where we we needed um, an animatronic baby. The problem is they they look robotic. A lot of the ones. I, I mean. <laughs> Even the highest dollar ones, they if, if you're too close on them. Yeah. Um, what I like to do is use the, they make a, a solid silicone rubber fake baby, um, mm. and and again get with visual effects, uh, and then they can add hand movement, fingers twitching, you know, uh, breathing, and uh, you know eyes, you know, blinking. Um, we did, we had a scene where I had a a newborn baby. It was like a cave baby. This is like 20,000 years ago. And, uh, where a baby's on the ground and a a rattlesnake has to crawl on top of the baby. So what we did was we used my silicone 
baby that was made to look as much as possible like the the real baby um and had the the snake crawl on top of the fake baby and then we uh so we got that footage first then we had the uh real baby at the studio did a 3d scan of the real baby and they just you know, pasted pasted the baby into that scene and it looked wow. pretty pretty good um so i i prefer you like i said using the silicone until you know animatronic babies get a little better i yeah. mean they're good for certain what about things, like like dogs but... they probably use them for like dead dogs or something mm -hmm. obviously you know yeah, there you know there are companies uh, like there's a company in Los Angeles called Creature Effects. Oh yeah, I've and seen that. I had to have an injured tiger, you know, yeah. uh, and they have that. They've got wow. re very realistic dogs, and it's all 100 percent artificial. They're, they're they're using you know artificial fibers in here, uh, the, and it looks they do incredible work. I want to ask you about your that warehouse you've got of props. And you said you you rent that stuff out. Is that Mm -hmm. how, is that expensive? And you, what do you rent it out by? It, does the price change depending on like how needed <laughs> the object is, or or w would I rent like a like an eraser at a different price <laughs> than I would rent? You know. Yeah, yeah. It, it would be based on the replacement cost of the item. Oh, okay. You know, if it's a really they're probably expensive item, like say, the set. say if it's the silicone fake baby that costs, you know. Three thousand oh, dollars. they're going to drop it for sure. You know, charge, uh, you know, three hundred a week or something like that. Right. You know, around ten percent ish. You know, it just it depends. And uh, and if it's kind of like you said, if it's a very popular item, maybe you go up in price. I don't know. I you know. That's pretty. I'm. Cool. Uh, that's a great business model where you can just like yeah, you know. I enjoy you it. Have both ends of the of the business there running that's great what are the like the most fun type of movie or tv show to work on for you you know i really enjoyed uh pitch perfect really um and now i think that was that was just a surprise because um i came in at the last minute they uh for whatever reason the other prop master left uh like on day one so I, and because I went in with expectations of, oh no, this is going to be bad. I'm coming in, not being able to prep or anything. Yeah. So I uh, didn't know what to expect, but everyone was so generous. They understood the situation I was in. They were just great. And the script was so funny. That's what the main thing was. The script was really funny. You had a lot of talented people, uh, you know, with uh, Rebel Wilson and Ellis, uh, uh, Elizabeth Banks. Um, oh, Anna geez. Kendrick. Uh, Isn't she in that? The names are slipping. Anna Kendrick. Yep. Anna, Anna Kendrick, Anna Camp. Um, yeah, they were all just really wonderful to work with. Um, and the music was fun. Just shooting. Uh, it, the only thing about working on a musical is you get so sick of the songs after a while because they're <laughs> shooting it from so many different angles yeah. and over and over and over. Well, what kind of props uh, were, but, were you yeah, called on for that? Oh my gosh! We had to make fake puke for one of the characters, like in the, like opening shot when she gets nervous, she throws up. So it was like we used, uh, I think it was um, V8 splash and applesauce, and then the effects guys rigged a you know propulsion <laughs> tank, oh, and it was right. just it was, it was yeah that was probably the big one for there. But yeah, nothing too crazy. We had like. Um, a trophy go through a glass wall and uh, we had a fight with some, you know, trophies over one of the acapella competitions and they had to kind of fall apart on cue. So you had to R and D how to, how to keep the trophies, you know, the triple stack trophies together until you need it to fall apart. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just little things like that. That's the fun stuff. It's the problem solving. It's the, yeah. you know, you never. What would know. be a dream job for you? Mm, for me, it uh, would be a period show, uh, oh, something yeah. uh, like a World War One type uh, 
thing. You know, I, I really enjoy doing the research and finding the old stuff. And like I said, dealing with old technology, it's really, it's, it can be difficult, uh, but I love, I love that challenge. And, yeah, yeah, and it's probably gonna... an added challenge today because of social media. Everybody's looking at everything you do with such scrutiny. And there's going to be experts who are going to look at that can that you make of, of seven. Oh, yeah. Oh, it wasn't For exactly sure. right, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. I did a show called Parkland that was about the, you know, JFK assassination and everything where we had to replicate the surgery at Parkland Hospital. And uh, and we we did the developing. We had a whole uh, dark room that was supposedly, you know, developing the Zapruder film. Right. And um, and I got. I don't know, IMDb, somebody made a comment about how the, the Kodak logo I used on the box wasn't quite right. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you've got to really do your it's research. Crazy. And, yeah, we live uh, in this age where everybody expects everything just to be so perfectly real. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like the most common comment is, oh, it looks fake on anything. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, wow, how yeah. in the world did you get involved in TikTok? So this was, it, let, me, let me guess, early 2020. Oh, I'm trying to oh. rattle my brain. What was going on in 2020? Of course. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd say it was, it wasn't until I didn't get a TikTok account. Well, I didn't start posting until like the first week of May 2020. And that was just dad jokes. Uh, I had my daughter, in, I guess it was in April. My daughter was, you know, becoming addicted to TikTok. And I was like, what are you, what are you looking at? And she'd just be laughing over in the corner. And I'm like, what is that? And some of those videos were really funny. Uh, and so I downloaded it. And I'm, so I, I started watching. And uh, then I'd, I'd see some people delivering dad jokes. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I can do that. You know, and I've dabbled in writing some jokes, too. And uh, so I, you know. Uh, started posting some and all oh, my early ones are horrible. It's where, you, yeah, I was still trying to figure <laughs> out what, what would work. You could definitely learned, see I, your evolution on that TikTok. I learned quickly that, you know, some, some people would deliver jokes and laugh while they're telling them. I can't do that. I cannot <laughs> laugh at my own uh, joke that I'm telling. I just, I can't fake laugh. I can't, uh, or, I, I just thought, you know, I'm just going to deadpan it. You got to deadpan let, delivery. Let, let, the, let the joke, uh, you know, if, if it's going to be funny, it'll have to win on its own merits because I'm not going to laugh at it to make people think that it's funny. You know what I mean? Right. So, uh, and, and that ended up working for me. And uh, then uh, I'd say I did that for, I, you know, I had a, re, a, a pretty decent following of about, 85,000 followers on TikTok before I even posted one prop video. And I started posting those around August of 2020. And um, one of my assistants was like, you know, you know, the jokes are funny and all, but what if you, you know, <laughs> what, what we do is interesting. We, yeah. we find it mundane, but that's because we've been doing it so long. But, you know, really some of this stuff, it's kind of, you look back on it, yeah, you know, if you step back and look at what we're doing, you know, it's it's kind of interesting. So uh, so that's when I started out with the beer bottle, or uh, you know, then showing the silent props, uh, rubber, you know, uh, I think a rubber frying pan was one of the first ones, and then I started adding in really bad foley. I'm so sorry, all you wonderful foley <laughs> artists out there. I, I try to give disclaimers. I'm I'm strictly just hitting the voiceover button and banging the side of my desk or uh, the gun cabinet or whatever and coming up with a slapstick sound just just to make it interesting. No, it adds to the whole aesthetic of your videos, yeah. you know. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so I just uh, started doing the uh, adding the props in and I guess one or two in I started you know do t tagging it with a joke and then that kind of people that it got to be where everyone expected it and uh so i i um pretty much i'd say 95 percent of my videos you know are tagged with a pun or yeah. they're you know in, in there somewhere but that's that's fun though it's like because people think i i build a video around a joke but i don't i i start with you know i i come up with a topic that i think people will enjoy and that's the challenge is, okay, how do, how do I, how do I slide, slide a joke in? <laughs> and it's, uh, and it, yeah, 
Sometimes we'll I'll see. wait. I'll wait weeks before filming something. That waiting because I'll be driving in my car. Okay, I got to come up. How am I gonna? How am I gonna hammer this home with a joke at the end? <laughs> oh, it would be easy, I'm sure, for you to just <laughs> do the prop half of the video. <laughs> we can yeah. show off the different props, but yeah, coming up with that that end cap yeah. there it's a little bit yeah. of a challenge i'm sure yeah. so, but it's fun and when it works it really works <laughs> well now then you started the youtube channel about a year later has that that one's going pretty well for you too huh do you find it's oh, just a whole different audience it is it is i yeah. just hit um yesterday hit five hundred thousand subscribers that's amazing in less than a year's time half a million and people. and you know what was crazy with uh, youtube is i started posting in what, may like mm -hmm. I think I, I said I started the channel like April 26, 2021, and then didn't post anything until the first week of May. Um, I was going in really hamstrung because someone had had been I was nervous about uh, just intimidated by YouTube. Number one, uh, I was barely figuring out TikTok and Instagram. So I was delaying uh, getting on YouTube. Well, somebody took advantage of that fact and started posting all my videos, like 40 oh. of them. Oh, and they and they had, yeah, they started a channel um, and it was just, it, it was my my profile picture. Can they just piss you off? All my oh, videos. Oh, man. Oh, but they had like, uh, it got to where they had it blocked where you couldn't see how many subscribers they mm -hmm. had. But, uh, but they had, you know, 10 million views in like, oh. three months. Oh. So, so I went into, so I did the whole, you know, copyright strike yeah. went in and, uh, they, well, and I did one of those, yeah, I did a TikTok video saying, Hey, by the way, if you're following this, you know, me on YouTube, it's not me, you know, but I waited to do that video once I set up my own channel. And then, um, so there were, my guesstimate is there were about a hundred thousand people that thought they were following me that weren't. Yeah. So I went in it, into it really set back and I, I didn't think I was going to be able to recover from that. So I ended up posting like 70 videos for between May and August. And I, I finally got to where I had 2000 subscribers, which I was like, and I had to like fight tooth and nail for the, I mean, really pushing for that. And then it just, the algorithm decided to smile and, and, you know, that first week of August, all of a sudden one, you know, like my uh, prop drinks video just took off. And then all the other ones kind of followed suit. And then I just kept up with it and uh, then trying to filter it. You know, working 12 hours a day on a TV show, it's hard to do the long form content. I want to do more of it. But uh, it's but the shorts with my career and what I do. Um, and a lot of the times that my career is the inspiration, because like I said, it's all about solving problems. It's like, I'll, you know, that, that help me is my, gives me content. So I'm not, you know, about to quit my job anytime yeah. soon. Uh, but there's no time to do like well-produced, uh, well-edited, you know, 15 minute long form YouTube videos. Um, I try to do some long form when I can, but you know, it's the, but the shorts, that's definitely working for me for now. And, well, your content is tailor made yeah. for that format. Yeah. I think it's just the right length for what you're doing and you get the, you get the information out there, you get the punchline and bam, there's certain channels that are just great for shorts. Do you feel like working well, on doing all this YouTube and TikTok now is like adding this other element of stress to your life now? Or do you feel pressure to like, oh, well, now this is a thing. Now I got to just do this. Well, now it's just kind of like it's something I do a lot as part of my job. You know, it's like at the end of the, you know, at the end of the day and during the week. But it's also a stress reliever for me. Mm -hmm. I enjoy creating. I enjoy making stuff up. I enjoy coming up with, you know, you know, most most film crew members are want to be writers, directors anyway. Yeah. So yeah. it's, uh, you know, as far as have at least dabbled in it somewhat. So it's, uh, for me, it's a, it's a good creative release. And, um, so that's the way I look at it is I really enjoy the creating part, but yeah, there are times where it can get to be a grind, especially when things get really busy with my real job. 
but uh, uh, I, you know, then I just back off and don't post as much. But I, you know, like I said, I'm. Give me a, give me uh, a clue of something we could see coming up, a prop that you haven't shown yet. Uh, you know, I'm looking. Do you have at a chainsaw? You did. You worked on Texas Chainsaw. You know, we did. That was that was built actually by the special. There was a special effects guy out of Chicago. Now I can't think of his name, um, but he made the chainsaws for that, and they oh, were basically. Oh. oh yeah, yeah. Uh, well, he he had. They were custom made. They dolled them up. They changed like you know, the real plastic covers. Yeah. Were, yeah, they yeah. they. Um, <laughs> changed out the plastic covers on an existing, probably a still or something like yeah. that, if I remember correctly. But they had it to where they had a rubber, uh, like a rubber chain on one to where you could see the spinning and then one that just uh, ran without, you know, spinning at all. And, you know, then then full full on the whole thing being rubber <laughs> uh, that, you know, where we molded them. Um, it was... Uh, uh, yeah, you you have just a ton of stuff in your arsenal for that because yeah. that's such a hero, hero item. How about about uh, like drugs, like snorting cocaine? Is that it's like a vitamin, right? Isn't that what they use? Like D six. Yeah, it's it's a real inert uh, vi vitamin powder called an inositol. Mm. I n o s i t o l. But I will say to anyone out there, you. <laughs> it's like a it's like a, a nutrition store typically would have that stuff, but always consult a doctor, talk to um, you know whoever uh, with casting and the actors, and you know run it by the you know all the producers before an actor inhales something up their nose. <laughs> wow, would that be <laughs> you would, know just it's got to be hard for an actor, <laughs> at least an actor who's never done a lot of cocaine, to to snort. A line of something if they've never done that before even though it's safe for them to use it's mm -hmm. got to be a, a tough to do yeah yeah and um you know it, it doesn't we don't have that happen that often i mean yeah. and then it, but there are rigs that um have been built i've never used them but with we're basically a mini vacuum hose that uh, you've got your dollar bill and <laughs> you have a hose hidden off and it'll you know yeah. snort it for you um, I've seen that done, but it's real cumbersome. You know, typically you, you probably either won't fake be... it with a cut, you know, you yeah. just have them running it through the little pile of Coke and they don't oh, inhale right. or, uh, you know, some people have no problem with it. And it's probably just, even a know. bigger one now would be smoking cigarettes since nobody smokes anymore. <gasps> oh, no. What, what, um, is there fake, they're fake cigarettes, right? But they, they pop. Yeah, they're herbal. Yeah, well, no, they're, they burn. There's herbal. Oh. Typically what's used are like there's a brand called Honey Rose. Um, there are all a bunch of different brands um, that uh, they're just herbal cigarettes. They're made out of rosemary, uh, red clover, and the marshmallow plant. Not Nothing like a real marshmallow, <laughs> but the marshmallow plant. I smoke a marshmallow. And, um, and uh yeah, but you're still, you know, it's still, you're burning something, yeah. you know, you still got smoke going into your lungs with that. Um, so either they fake it, uh, you know, pretend inhale, but they'll use the herbals. Um, there, I wish I had one here to show you, but they do make a, um, a vapor one that uses a vapor mm -hmm. fluid, a non-nicotine, a uh, vegetable-based glycol. And, um but but to me those still look fake you know even though they light up on the end and whatnot it's good for yeah. maybe background actors in a bar but um you're really better off you know using the herbals you know but i you know if uh if it's a uh, an actor that's never smoked before you know i had one that insist on smoking a real cigarette <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think you want to do that. Yeah, you, you might want to and, think twice about this. And yeah, because you know, the, you, because your character is supposed to be smoking through this whole three-page scene, and that can take you know three hours to shoot. You don't want to be smoking a real cigarette that long. No. If you have it. But plus, they don't really smoking. know how to smoke it up. It never really looks <laughs> right. You can, I can almost tell because years ago I used to mm -hmm. smoke, and I could tell when somebody hasn't smoked and they're faking it. And it just doesn't look right. Yeah. Yeah, there's no real way to hold it in your <laughs> mouth and pretend that that smoke has gone into your lungs and back. Yeah, it's, yeah. right. 
Uh, so either you do, I just tell them, well, either, you know, if, if you, if you don't want to really inhale, don't do it because people will make fun of you. Yeah. You know? Right. Especially now when it's so easy to make comments on, you know, Twitter and whatnot. So, you know, I highly advised against it unless they're going to, you know, actually smoke, a, you know, an herbal at least. Yeah. What kind of projects you got in store? You're working on Walker right now, right? Is that it's in hiatus I or something? I would just finished up season two, and then I'm going to start back on season three mid-July. Oh, so it got picked up for yeah. a third season. Oh, yeah. Oh, got picked up for a third season. And I might fill in with some commercials, but I do get to take a little bit of a break. Oh, nice. Well, you get the summer off, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I also run my prop shop and do all that. Right. So. How many people you got? Odds are I'll make a video or two. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Try to get caught up. Maybe stockpile some. <laughs> Yeah, really. Well, I'm really looking forward to seeing how all of that grows. It's been really fun watching your videos. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I love watching your stuff. Thanks for, for giving us this wonderful podcast. I, uh, I saw, um, what was the, the last one you did with Kampf? Uh, her first Laura name? Kampf. Laura oh, Kampf. She's great. She did. And well, because of you, I discovered her oh. and... Uh, saw her make a uh what, a barbecue out of a toolbox <laughs> yeah she loves doing amazing. that kind of stuff oh just i love i love the repurposing of stuff it's cool yeah well scott it was great talking to you no great talking to you thanks so much for having me you're welcome